What we have here, we have three practitioners in reintroductions. Uh, my guess is that if we put together their personal experience in translocating animals, I mean themselves, in organizing the translocations or doing the capture or handling the animals, the three together probably have moved more animals than the rest of the audience here. So the, the, the amount of experience that we have in Southern Africa, and this is important when we talk about Southern Africa because it's not the same as South Africa. I mean, we're talking about South Africa, Namibia, Botswana, Zimbabwe, Malawi, now it's moving to Rwanda, which is Central Africa. Uh, it's just, they, as you will see, they, they work in another league. Uh, and the level of experience that they have, especially with large animals, is just staggering. So we're going to start with with Marcus Hofmeyer, uh, who has worked in the government. He's now working in an NGO. Uh, as you will see, lots of experience. And then, after, I mean, after Marcus creates kind of the, the context and the, and the general information on the framework, uh, we, will, we have the opportunity to have Simon, who came up as a participant, who's managing a private reserve, and, he, who's, and that managing that reserve includes doing translocations all the time. And Mark Stallmans, who is the scientific director of one of the most uh, ambitious rewilding projects in the world right now, which is in Gorongosa in Mozambique. Uh, so yeah, let's start. Mark, welcome, please. It was on. Can you all hear me? Thank you very much. It's a huge honor to be here, and um, I'm very humbled to represent, uh, together with my colleagues Mark and Simon, the African continent, which is obviously uh, rather large and diverse. <laughs> um, and we are very lucky that we have a full spectrum of large mammals that are still present, unfortunately declining mostly, but uh, in some areas it's been the opposite. And uh, Obviously, translocations have played a significant role at recovering and distributing large mammals back to their original spaces. Um, the experience with small mammals like Australia or the Oceanic, uh, Oceanic Islands, birds, they exist, but uh, fortunately, the, those species are pretty robust because we've got large intact landscapes still for now. Uh, but I have to say that the capture of those species are done at an industrial scale for bushmeat tra trade and illegal wildlife trade, uh, leading to many landscapes almost emptied of everything, including small mammals and birds. So the reintroduction of those species may need to be done in the future. Um, I also want to acknowledge all the pioneers, the incredible bold people that went out there and tried things uh, from which you know, we all learned. And, uh, as time goes along, it's becoming more scientific. Initially, it was extremely um, practical, learn by doing. I'll talk a little bit about that. But I think the, the key message is that as we go along and we learn more and more, we obviously have to become more scientific, but we can't leave behind the pragma pragmatism. <laughs> okay, so I'll start off with probably one of the biggest success stories in Africa, the white runner, southern white runner recovery. They went down to, to less than 50 individuals left over in one park in South Africa by the beginning of the last century. And um, uh, provincial, South Africa is divided up into provinces, and uh, each province has its own environmental or conservation agency, and at that time it was Natal Parks Board. Uh, and there was a very visionary conservationist, Dr. Ian Player, who you may have all heard about. He was instrumental at taking risks experimenting and starting to move rhinos out of the park after they were secured and started growing to beyond the 50 that they were there. And uh, if it wasn't for those efforts, we wouldn't have over 15,000 slow breeding large pachyderms recovered. If you contrast that with the northern white rhino with politics, NGO infighting, uh, competition for funding, and just general confusion has led to literally the extinction of the very same species, and it could have gone the same route if some bold actions had been taken if, a few decades ago. So I do want to acknowledge Dr. Ian Player. He unfortunately passed away a few years ago, um, but certainly an icon of 
conservation in general, but translocations to a large degree. And he's not a veterinarian, he was a practitioner, just a, a, a ranger and a scientist. And uh, I mean, the stuff they did was just absolutely pioneering. It was just simply because somebody was prepared to try and get on with it. Let's start with, you, with your experience in some parks. I mean, I think the first time we met, you were working, you were working for the system of national parks in South Africa, okay? So something that is quite rare and quite unique is that a national park service has a team, a, a direction, kind of, a, a service within the service focused on, on game trust locations, on wildlife trust locations. I mean, I haven't heard that from any other national park service. They don't have it in the United States. They don't have it in Spain. National park services don't have a team whose uh, role is to move animals, restore populations, plant that, or whatever. So, uh, yeah, explain us about how was that experience working in the, in the South African government and, and how, why and that, that was being done. So, uh, as Ignacio pointed out, the ability to move animals you know, requires some resources, techni te uh, technical expertise, and it actually started in the Tal Parks Board a province of South Africa where the runners were recovered, they developed a game capture unit that was run by the provincial government. Um, South African National Parks followed suit. It took a bit longer, but they also then created an, uh, a, a game capture unit, which we eventually turned into a service delivery department, which I was very um, uh, privileged to run for almost 18 years. How many people were working in that? So we had 50 people in the, in the department. And okay. the entire department's role was to provide a veterinary and wildlife translocation and management service to sand parks and also regionally, and I'll explain some of those steps. So there are similar units that have been developed. The Zimbabwean parks, when they were still functional, had a capture unit which was extremely effective. Uh, the Ministry of Environment and Tourism in Namibia, similar, similar thing, but most other African countries may have had it. Kenya Wildlife Services is another example of a very well-established uh, government-based capture translocation unit. And, um, but for the, for the rest, there were some inklings of that in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, but as governments changed and political emphasis changed, those institutional capacities generally got eroded, and now it's primarily the private sector that is driving this translocation move into, into uh, the rest of Africa. Um, so, so sand parks or South African National Parks are very lucky they've had a 120 plus existence, so they've had a huge amount of history behind them, and they were, up until recently, very scientifically driven. So a lot of the decisions that were made was based on good science, including translocations, um, and it, it was also because they and Natal Parks were able to fund themselves through tourism income. So they, they delivered a biodiversity mandate for the country or the province. Um, they had their own tourism facilities that earned income, and more recently, unfortunately, that's one of the problems in, in Africa is that conservation was a very us and them scenario where conservationists would be inside the parks and communities that lived outside the park were not necessarily allowed in, and that uh, is, is something that now has to change because if you don't become socially accepted as a conservation project, as we heard with all the previous speakers, you generally are not going to be successful. And then one aspect which was very different to most and still remains different to the rest of Africa is that South African National Parks, Natal Parks, were able to sell their wildlife to the private sector, which earned huge amount of money for development of equipment, buying more land for national parks, so almost functioning like a semi-autonomous little business unit for the government, and it was hugely successful. Unfortunately, in all the countries where there's been these units, the political changes have resulted in those flexible arrangements being restricted through bureaucracy, and um, it's the biggest enemy, in my opinion, of uh, translocation success. As we heard also yesterday with many of like Australia, the permits, I mean, in South Africa, uh, now if you want to move a, a rhino from Kruger National Park to some other part of the country, you may have to have as many as nine permits to do that. It can take a year to get all those permits. So bureaucracy and the way procurement and government spending is being restricted is, is eroding the ability for these very functional units to actually function effectively and are very fast being overtaken by private sector units that have taken the lessons learned that were all started in government agencies in Southern Africa and in Kenya to a large degree and, and almost like perfecting them and making them more efficient. 
There are some issues around that, but I'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, and I think the other important aspect that needs to be understood, particularly in the Namibian, South African, and Zimbabwean context, is that a lot of the animal move movement, development, and technology that was developed came because there was a private industry that could put wildlife onto their own land. Uh, so not necessarily purely conservation moves, but more commercial drive. The hunting was allowed in all three countries. Uh, and the, the rise of what we call game farming, commercial game farming, was the driver for all the fast and huge numbers of animals that were moved. I mean, in South Africa and Namibia, at the peak of this game industry bubble, probably 100 to 200,000 animals were moved, wildlife species were moved annually uh, through very efficient means. Whereas if you want to do it from a conservation perspective, you have to separate that out. We don't want to be farming with wildlife. We want free-range ecosystem driver systems where wildlife play their roles in the ecosystem, like we heard with many of the previous speakers, where if we do rhino translocations, ultimately we want that to end up in supporting ecosystem health, not just confining it into a small package of land and almost like have a semi-captive situation. So again, I just want to reiterate the experience that we've gained in South Africa is because individuals in the previous century were very dynamic pioneers, and we've, we've progressed from catching animals with lassoes, which was done fairly regularly in East Africa, in particular for the zoo industry in particular, to highly sophisticated operations. This was a rhino that was moved in April over 220 kilometers with a helicopter. It's the furthest uh, uh, wildlife species, in my, in my knowledge, in that format was flown. Highly successful. And again, trying and just working with, with uh, willing partners to actually make that work. And I would recommend this technique if the budget was available for any difficult recovery of rhino or other species as well. Any questions? So again, to show the value of this bold initiatives to do translocations, this is now the sand parks example of recovering white and black rhino. So the uh, Kaizenen Wildlife or Natal Park Association made 351 rhino, white rhinos available to the Kruger National Park in the 60s and 70s. Those, there were no rhinos in, in Kruger left by that time. Uh, those 351 rhinos, because there was available land in a secure area, and even though they're slow breeders, it takes two to three years between calves for white rhinos, uh, if everything is uh, going well from a habitat and a nutrition point of view, to the point where the population Kruger grew, grew to over 8,000 individuals, and we were able to remove before, again, bureaucracy and policy and state veterinary regulations uh, resulted in um, the movement of rhinos being stopped because of tuberculosis. But we moved over 1,500 white rhinos out of Kruger to other areas in Africa and uh, to private land in South Africa, and those that cycle of reintroductions, allowing the population to grow, and then again moving rhinos to other areas has resulted in that incredible recovery of that species. So I cannot overemphasize how important it is to have translocation as an option, wild translocations, for species recovery. So just to point out again, uh, again, why South African national parks in particular have been very pioneering what they did, we have 22 national parks with only those two, the Kruger National Park and the Kalahari Transfrontier Park, uh, established when uh, there was a lot of wildland available. Pretty much every other national park in South Africa was, was rewilded. So from farming land, land was brought up. Uh, they were specifically placed in areas that are unique from a vegetation and a, a biophysical uh, perspective in South Africa. So all these other parks here in the south were established long after Kruger and Khalakhari were established. They, it was land being brought up, rehabilitation, and then obviously reintroductions of all the larger mammals. So many of these parks were denuded farmland and are now examples of that particular habitat in South Africa with the entire suite of large mammals that used to exist there, all through translocation practice very successfully. Okay, this, this whole Practice with sand parks extended beyond their own national parks. We were selling wildlife to private individuals. And then in the 2000s, early 2000s, the Transfrontier Initiative started 
with uh, the presidents of South Africa and Mozambique and Zimbabwe signing an agreement to create what we call the Great Limpopo Transfrontier Conservation Area. It's an area that encompasses over 100,000 square kilometers. The parks in Mozambique, Limpopo National Park, Banin, and Zinaf, ironically, were the sources of all the large mammals that repopulated Kruger, which didn't have many large mammals at the time it was proclaimed, are now the ones that are being restocked from Kruger, where they were saved and had a safer environment, because uh, at the time uh, there was a civil war in, in Mozambique, and pretty much all the large mammals were depleted, either for the use of ivory for buying weapons, or for actual meat to feed the, the armies that were fighting each other. We have translocated from Kruger over 5,000 individual animals into Limpopo National Park. It was unfortunately politically driven and not necessarily following all of those steps that were highlighted in previous presentations and that we really recommend. You obviously need to make sure that if you go with a conservation translocation that your reasons why they weren't, they're no longer animals are there are those reasons or those um, problems have been removed because you can't just stick animals in and hope that things will go well. I think we've had numerous examples of how that can fail. So uh, the most important aspect of reintroduction in Africa is the landscape is generally fairly intact, but if you don't take away the risk of poaching, snaring, very simple weapons, uh, shotguns, gin traps, you can lose all of your animals very quickly after you've reintroduced them. And there have been a number of unfortunate political driven reintroductions because it looks good on paper and when the animals are released into areas where the local communities haven't necessarily been involved with the decision making or the bottom up approach, you hear the noises in the background where they just say basically, ah, thank you, you've brought us meat, instead of this is our heritage. And we need to be aware of these tensions that exist so that we don't keep on failing. And there are many examples where we don't have those failures where it's actually being improved. The way these animals are moved, to a large degree, is a technique that was sort of concurrently developed in Kenya, Namibia, and South Africa. It's using plastic corrals and a helicopter. And as I said, literally hundreds of thousands of wildlife species are moved like this every year. It's a very simple technique. The helicopter chases the species you want to catch into a, a, a plastic holding facility that has running gates that you close behind them. And you basically just move the whole herd forward and you can then load them directly into the truck. Either you first tranquilize them or you tranquilize them in the truck. Some species don't have to tranquilize. And um, in a day you can catch, you know, depending on how many trucks you've got available, you can catch anything from uh, you know, a few individuals to 100, 200 animals and move them to their new destinations. <coughs> right, that's sort of just an okay. example of... Sand parks, as an example. Okay, so, so now, now the, the next block is your experience with Madrique. I mean, the, the establishment of a park in an area that didn't exist, and how that was connected with star locations, but also with, with local development and, uh, and jobs and, yeah, and opportunities and the result. So Madrique Game Reserve is a very interesting case study, and I think um, both Corongosa and Pinda will speak to similar processes. It's a reserve that was established at the time when South Africa was very divided uh, from a, um, a way land was distributed. Ironically, that land was bought up from white farmers and given to what at that time existed as, as uh, local homelands for communities that uh, lived in that area. The leader at the time was very progressive. Uh, he had developed his own parks board with some capture uh, ability, and he initiated a study in this landscape. Uh, so all of this land was a whole bunch of cattle farmers that actually, in, uh, to be brutally honest, were abusing that land completely. It was degraded, it was uh, overgrazed, uh, bush encroached, and he, uh, he did a uh, study to, to, to decide what will be the best land use for the community's benefit in that area. So, the three options that were looked at was irrigation from a dam that existed on the border, communal cattle farming, or an ecotourism initiative. So the, the project was developed not as, an, as a conservation project, but as a socioeconomic development operation or project. And some money was made available from the government. Um, the staff of that particular um, Parks Board, it used to be called the Babudatswana Parks Board, was staffed by experienced individuals that were disgruntled with 
uh, what was happening in Zimbabwe or in Natal parks and had a huge amount of experience. So there was, a, there was literally hundreds of um, years of cumulative experience in that team to make this happen at a very quick rate. So over a period of roughly eight years, and I think it's still the largest single restocking operation ever done. 8,200 animals of 28 species were reintroduced after the fences were taken down and a perimeter fence was put up, which included all the large pachyderms, all the large antelopes, and all the pre large predators. Fortunately, smaller mammals were already present in fairly good numbers, so that wasn't really a concern. And some of the sequencing was good and some weren't, but that's one aspect that I think we learned a lot from. It was also the first place in, in Africa where African wild dogs were actually successfully reintroduced into a fenced property where they were retained and couldn't break out. It's uh, really interesting how this project act became an immediate socioeconomic driver. The initial jobs when the farmland was brought out were maybe 120 jobs, lowest pay, uh, no skills development at all, to a project that employs probably now well over a thousand people just for the reserve and probably two or three thousand additional jobs just around there from community or industry related jobs uh, and, and, and um, businesses. So that socio-economic project has become a home for endangered species, they've done very well there and they've also become the source of translocations to other parts of South Africa and other countries in, in Africa. So again, it's how you frame all of this and where many African examples exist. We, we need to start looking at conservation rewilding, not only as a conservation project, but as proper development, socio-economic development engines. Because without that ecotourism initiative, those, those people would not, not have the opportunities they have now. And at the end of the day, certainly in Africa, when it comes to getting social buy-in. The single biggest factor that drives it is, the, is job creation. So these are examples of where that's really done. I think we'll have some more discussion on that um, when Simon and Mark talk. We show a video? Yep. So now the, the kind, of, kind of the question is how something that started in the 60s with Ian Player uh, trying to capture rhinos with a, with a noose, loose, uh, like, like John Wayne movie, yeah. uh, has become something so sophisticated. I don't know if there's a picture here. No, okay. So, so sophisticated as this. So the question is, what, what was the process? We're going to show this video. So the question is, how can you move from capturing one rhino with a, with a rope to moving 500 elephants in a single operation? So I think we, we chose elephant as an example. I mean, it's a, a large pachyderm. It's maybe an extreme example, but it is very relevant. And I'll, I'll quickly explain why. Um, elephants are absolutely essential for the majority of the African landscapes, all the savannas, all the tropical rainforests, even some of the deserts, because they habitat drivers and they used to move and shape landscapes that was then you know, specifically um, good for other species. And as the, the ivory trade increased, elephants virtually disappeared from 
most landscapes, and it's now trying to recreate some of those processes. But there are obviously issues that come with it because most areas where you put elephants into now have to be fenced because of the higher human density and the conflict that elephants create. A herd of elephant goes into a field, they will destroy that field, and that field may be the only food source for a particular community member. So it's a very, it's a very controversial um, process. The skills to move large numbers of elephants have now been developed, and I'll go through the whole process of how that became possible. Um, but it also highlights the tension that exists between what the developed world, particularly Europe, UK, and the US, want to see happen and what people that live with these animals can and, and will tolerate. So in the Western world, elephants basically are people with trunks. People are emotional about them. They don't want them to be killed. They want them to get, be rewilded. And as I said, for a community member that lives with elephants, has his crop destroyed, it's a real life-threatening risk. So how do you marry those two? Because the money that comes for translocations generally come from the people that think that, that they are people with trunks. And the people that actually have to live with them and gain benefits from them don't necessarily get consulted in the process. Anyway, just to get back to the evolution, <coughs> some of those factors that I think often are not necessarily clearly uh, thought through, it's more and more a requirement, but you obviously want to make sure that wherever you take elephants, the reasons why they're not there are, are reversed and that they are then safely protected in the landscape they're going to be put into. Uh, the equipment has to evolve for the more and more difficult translocation processes that one attack. And it all really started in the, in the 60s and 70s and 80s where in Zimbabwe and in South Africa there was an active culling program for elephants in the Kruger National Park and Wangi National Park because at the time they were working on carrying capacities and wanted to keep numbers stable for, for the reasons that they thought out at the time. But they would then capture the young elephants and group them up and then release them, and individually transport them in crates. All of those sort of uh, animals that you could still physically handle were captured. Anything bigger were, were euthanized. And then in South Africa in particular, a whole number of parks received these orphans as uh, sort of cohorts. They were released in groups. Um, but very quickly it became apparent as they grew up that elephants actually require social structure. They need to learn certain behaviors. And um, in South Africa alone, over 200 white rhino were killed by aberrant male, young, sexually active elephants, which normally at that age would not be sexually active because they'd either be disciplined by the mothers or there would be bigger bulls in must that would control that. So obviously this is not the way to do it. So in the early 90s, these are just some photos of elephants in Pilansburg that want to tried to mate with a rhino, and uh, many rhinos died like this and in other parks. So the first attempts to start moving other elephants started, and then in Zimbabwe, Clem Kutsia, who was also an incredible pioneer with captures. Um, his skill was a diesel mechanic. He had equipment that were 50, 30, 50 years old, but all of them worked seamlessly, and he had that dedication to actually make the team that worked with the animals and the equipment work seamlessly together. So they started with family group captures in Gonorazo National Park, very much a physical manpower-related operation. But they started with capturing whole family groups and moving them to other places. They then came to the Kruger National Park, who then adopted the methodology, but then very quickly evolved the equipment that was required to do that. So it required bigger trucks, cranes, specialized um, transport containers for big bulls, and on top of that, the private sector even perfected it even more. So we can now move entire subsections of elephants, like that video showed in Malawi, more or less anywhere where there's reasonable road access, or even no road access. So the ability to move large numbers of elephants has now been perfected, and it keeps on being perfected, particularly by Kester Vickery and his team. This is his team. And all of this equipment had to come from South Africa to Malawi. That's a challenge in itself. It takes months and months of planning, huge amounts of money, but it's all possible. And again, it's because people are prepared to take a risk and try things and learn from their mistakes. So the equipment was boxed up in a uh, McConaughey-style setup because when you wake an elephant up, especially an adult, you need to be able to 
uh, give them enough room to rock and stand up because when you catch them, you dart them, and you put them in the wake-up crate to sleep, and they need to then stand up and then move across to the transport crate. They've perfected that even more for the small elephants by physically just opening the roof of the crates and putting the elephants directly into the transport containers. So I think the most elephants that have been moved in a single day is 36. And uh, I can tell you if I haven't caught quite a few elephants myself, that's a, that's a huge achievement from an efficiency point of view. <clears throat> so all of this development uh, is now needing to take into consideration where landscapes have become available and made safer for elephants. But how do you get those animals there? And we'll have another example a bit down the line of how that can be happening. But this is Kester Vickery. He's a, um, a real pioneer. Not only has, does he need to understand how the logistics work, he needs to know how to build roads to be able to get the equipment in. He needs to understand the animals he works with and manage a whole team under that. And those individuals are often the ones that push the boundaries and move forward and actually achieve these incredible outcomes that we have. And he, he and his team are pri the primary uh, implementers of moving large numbers of not only elephants but other wildlife into areas in Africa where that has not been possible up until now. And this is just an example of the level of ev evolution and the investment that's gone. This is uh, Kester's team in Lawi, and that's sort of probably at the pinnacle of where we are at the moment with all the different types of trucks and equipment and cranes and people. And his team is very small, maybe 10 people. And he'll move, or they did move, the 500 elephants over a couple of years in Malawi. So just in parallel, the, the same sort of innovation has taken place for most larger mammal species in Africa. You're catching them in nets, passively catching them, darting them, um, going from large antelope to small specialized antelope like the clipspringer, which live in mountains. You can either catch them with nets around the little hillock that they live on, or you dart them. Um, we've learned how to release them, similar to Black rhino, it doesn't help just opening the box and let them go because they live in pairs or little family groups. So we've learned now that you need to knock them down, wake them up as a group and not have a camera crew and many people to actually uh, disturb them. We've used helicopters to recover animals out of very difficult places. It's a technique that many people find a little bit difficult to understand, but very few mortalities and no injuries have really been associated with this technique. And it's very effective and it can be used Anyway, I mean, you saw a picture of Aldabra, I think it was a Galapagos um, tortoises being flown in to Round Island. And very importantly, the lessons learned around the different species that have different ecological niches that they fill. And I, and I use this picture that I got from Chap Masterson and when he was working in KZN. I think this is actually in Pinda. Um, those are two male leopard walking a boundary. And now if you stick another male leopard in there from a translocation point of view, they're going to kill that new male leopard or one of the others are going to fight. But if you don't understand this incredible tight territory setup, translocating, as was pointed out yesterday uh, from the oceanographic Oce um, examples, it's not always appropriate to do translocations if you don't understand what's happening at the source or at the, the end, end uh, uh, position. <coughs> I just wanted to pause there and see if there were any questions. Because it's just really to show the massive evolution of capture techniques, so we're able to move pretty much any I th wild I th animal. I think just kind of to summarize and kind of to, to highlight, I mean, the main point is, I mean, we are, or I understand of what you're telling is a continent that has m much less economic res resources than North America or Europe has been able, through practice and through trial and error, to move from something that was extremely basic to a level of sophistication that would be equivalent to sending a rocket from here to Mars. And that the rest of the continents are, are still, some, in some countries they are still arguing if rockets fly, and in others, okay, they, they reach to the moon. So, why that happened? I mean, why Africa, having many less economical resources, was able to learn so fast and become so practical. And also, I think, something that comes from your presentation, this is not about elephants, it's about elephants, rhinos, lions, uh, wild dogs, so almost every species. With their different ecological requirements and social behavior and everything, uh, how could this happen? 
I mean, what, what, what do you think was the reason and why it didn't happen in other places? So I think part of the success that happened is because, as was pointed out yesterday, that you have individuals that are larger than life and tried things and started to do things in a, almost like a, a, a commercial scale and it worked. And then I think a big push that allowed for this development is for private people to actually own wildlife. If it wasn't for that, I doubt very much if this type of uh, economic, uh, this type of te uh, technology development would have taken place because there was an engine, an economic engine behind it where people got paid salaries to move animals rather than uh, it being a government department or an NGO that was trying to find the money from all over. So I think that was a very simple process and, and that own private ownership was very much linked to the hunting industry because that was the first use of wildlife in South Africa, Namibia and Zimbabwe. It wasn't so much as, a, as just breeding stock but it was for the hunting industry. So the private farms were allowed to hunt their own wildlife. And I know a lot of people don't agree with the practice, but the fact of the matter is that in, in southern Africa there's now more wildlife present on private land and in large landscapes than there was 100 years ago. And you compare that to West Africa where there's hardly any free-range wildlife left except in a few national parks, and in East Africa where there's been a massive decline in free-range wildlife outside of national parks because there is no ownership of wildlife there. And, okay. and that is, I think, a fundamental reason why that massive push take place. I think it's evolving. There's now uh, various NGOs, including African parks, that are taking on the mandate of managing rundown and under-resourced national parks all over Africa, particularly in countries that have absolutely no resources to do that. And with the backing of philanthropists and uh, NGO money are trying to rapidly restore those incredible landscapes. I mean, there's projects going on in the Central African Republic, which is probably the remotest and least governed country in Africa, and they're managing to do that. And it's because the projects, as we explained with Medikwe, are economic engines. So they become relevant politically and from a community development point of view. And I think that's very important to also understand that the evolution is taking place. Yes, there's private ownership in Southern Africa, but going forward, it's going to be ensuring the protection of large landscapes through a wildlife model nature-based solutions, and hopefully carbon credits and uh, natural capital credits will be the economic engine going forward, because those are the gold, the gold dust of Africa. There's large la open landscapes disappearing very quickly, and I'll talk about that just now. So just to get back to the elephants, most elephants now have to be introduced into fenced areas. Uh, that has a whole lot of challenges. It costs a lot of money, but if you don't put up a fence, you are going to have conflict, and you will most likely lose the support of the communities that live in and around there. So when you reintroduce them, you need to make sure that elephants respect the fence because most of the translocations that have taken place come from areas other where elephants don't know fences or have learned to not respect them. So your initial introduction has to, in a way, teach the elephants to respect, and now most of the electric fences are used to do that because it becomes a psychological barrier for that animal to move across the fence. Very simple technique, but it requires manpower and maintenance, and those things often fall flat. And a good fence is only as good as electrification, and a fence without electrification results in conflict, and very quickly the whole good economic engine that you've got can spiral out of control in, in Mozambique, for example, that's a huge issue. Every parliamentary meeting there's issues about elephant conflict, how are we going to solve this, and this tension about not shooting them and not getting rid of them because of donor pressure, and the very communities that actually have, have to live with those elephants. And then there's obviously the issue that is really important to also understand. If you put a large pachyderm that has a major impact on its vegetation into a confined area and in the process increase the uh, intensity, we call it the intensity of use. So instead of moving through an area and intensively using that piece of landscape for a few weeks, a few months, they're now using that landscape permanently at an intense scale. And that has obviously unintended consequences on on vegetation, but it's not all that clear exactly how that works. It's usually a combination of factors that cause that to happen, as some of these examples are. This is a, a plot in Kruger National Park where we have no elephants on the left and elephants on the right and fire on both sides. And you'd think, okay, well, the reason there's more trees on the left is because there's no elephants. This is a similar plot in the Kruger Park where you have no fire, but you have elephants on both sides. So you can see it's not always just one driver that creates that change in, in, in vegetation and landscape. And it's usually a combination of factors. The elephants damage the bark of a tree, 
the fire gets into the bark and kills that tree. If you had less elephants and less intense use, you had more trees that survived that thing. There are many small parks in South Africa, Namibia, in Zimbabwe, where there are now large, largely no more large trees left in that property because of elephants. So there are very few options to deal with this. So again, you know, one needs to think very carefully and think on that 100-year plan when you're doing these reintroductions, not just for the immediate donor drive or the immediate ecotourism reward that you're going to get by putting a new species into a property. So I think ecological considerations have to become more and more underlying the reasons why we translocate elephants. So in South Africa, contraception is now commonly practiced, but it does not change the intensity of use. All it does is slows the growth down of the species. So you have to understand that, it's a, that whatever you do, if you confine animals and you're not mimicking natural processes, you are going to have changes to what that landscape looks like. And some of them are not going to be in, in the favor of many other species. So a lot of research has been done. Uh, PZP immunocontraception is now pretty much routinely practiced in all small reserves in South Africa. It's very effective. You can, in a way, sort of determine which animals are going to have the calf next, and you can slow the growth run. You can even have slightly negative growth rate. But again, unless this changes the intensity of use, it's not going to materially impact on how the landscape changes over time. So there is a requirement to... I uh, just wanted to talk about this quickly. So obviously, with this sort of pressure and from donors not wanting to see elephants dying, there have been initiatives that are very much driven from academic institutions from outside of Africa, cost a lot of money. This is a project that was driven by Disney at the time. Uh, they, I think they've sectimized about 20 elephants. It takes about four hours, about 20 to 30,000 US dollars per elephant vasectomy, if it is successful. And they got an award for this in the US. Um, it hasn't been applied in Africa anyway, because it's too expensive and it's not practical at all. Some of the properties they worked on, you, you vasectomize two bulls and then they don't breed and then young, a young bull sneaks in and uh, causes the pregnancy. So you need to be very pragmatic about how and where you want to spend your money and who you're actually going to be partnering with to do this. So the, the longer term solution for most areas is moving elephants back to rangeland which has now been secured or expanding parks where they are in. And in South African national parks have had a very big drive and are still maintaining that to expand the land that they're on. So whatever elephant populations they have, then have access to bigger areas. And then you start manipulating water so that they don't have access to water everywhere, forcing them to mimic some of those movements that they would have had. Maybe even at a small scale can have an impact. So this is an example of elephants being expanded in Addo National Park, the only truly South African population of elephants that survived the ivory, ivory hunting um, disaster of the 1800s. <clears throat> uh, only 13 survived. They went down to nine. Uh, those nine were made up of mothers and calves, so for a period there, were no, no, there was no breeding until the calves grew to an age that they could mate the male calves with their sisters and their mothers. And now there are over 500, 600 adult elephants. We did do an, 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 a genetic introduction in 2004. So there is now changes happening, but it's interesting to note that that small, very small core population has recovered to that state, and there's no indications that there are significant health or genetic problems. And I think the reason for that is that inherently, particularly in pachyderms, your genetic heterogeneity is quite robust. So you can, if you start getting outbreeding, you, you don't end up having all of these problems, particularly with uh, uh, species that have a faster generation turnover time, as we have heard in uh, other talks. <clears throat> and then we, we do need to acknowledge that these elephants have huge impacts. If you fence them in, they will utilize every single square centimeter of that property, which they would normally not do if they did have access to a, a free-range movement. So. This is where we come back to the Great Limpopo Transfrontier Park. It is one, one of the few examples where there is huge hope to allow for this expansion to take place through proper land management in areas where they, they were exterminated through illegal killing. Gonorizo National Park in Zimbabwe currently holds over 11,000 elephants. You won't believe that that's more elephants than in the entire of Mozambique now. But they won't go to Mozambique because they're afraid to go there. So we need investment to allow for uh, corridors and elephants to move out by themselves, but you have to take away those drivers that make them afraid to move into that landscape. They will rather live 
in a tightly packed in environment, the same as the cougar elephants, then going into a landscape that's got lots of food, lots of water, but it doesn't have security. And they learn that, and they will respond to that. So we need to change the way the land becomes available to them, but you can only do that if the populations that live there, so Mozambique has a small population of people that live here, in and around these parks. They're the most impoverished communities of the whole of Mozambique, and they have not really seen any real benefits from having wildlife areas in that area. So we need to invest in how do we co-create a landscape where they can coexist with wildlife and they truly benefit from those coexistence opportunities. And we need, to, we need to work with those people directly. We can't impose any solutions on them. And I think we, we're starting to really work hard on that in Africa, but it's been long overdue. And that's sort of the big next evolution of uh, rewilding opportunities. But this area is 100,000 square kilometers of intact woodland with very little wildlife in it, except in Kruger and in Gonorrhoe Zoo. Imagine if we can find a way to let those people benefit from carbon credits and allow corridors for wildlife to move, and all of those come along with opportunities that they didn't have otherwise. You have both a, glow, a, a recovery of species and you're sequestering carbon that is so critically important for the survival of everybody else on this planet. And we should be harnessing money from countries that are excreting most of the carbon to support these very poor communities. And those are initiatives that I think are really going to take a hold now, and hopefully it will be better than all the previous development projects that have come into Africa. So just, just to come to a sort of conclusion on some of the threats, this is a, a connectivity map that was developed by the Wild Crew for lines as a proxy of landscape connectivity in the 60s, when there were still large areas of true connectivity that and a lion living in East Africa could almost move all the way down to Southern Africa, and that probably did happen. To where we are currently, you can see there's been more than 50% reduction in connectivity. Africa is poised to be the next growth of human population. The next billion people are predicted to be coming all from Africa, all needing land resources, and those wild spaces and connected spaces are very rapidly disappearing to a very realistic prediction that what the landscape will look like by 2050. Hardly any connectivity, just a few spots on the continent where we still have opportunities to maintain those, which means that animals are going to be isolated into pockets of conservation land, similar to what we're seeing in India and in Europe, and we're going to have to mimic processes so translocations will become more important into the future than what they are now. So again, we need to learn all the lessons and, and actually evolve to then incorporate some of those coexistence and livelihood opportunities that have to come with translocations and rewilding of spaces. I think you're all familiar with this picture. You know, 10,000 years ago, there was mostly wildlife, a few people. And as it states now, for large mammal biomass on, on the continents, hardly any wildlife, lots of livestock and lots of people. And this is just a picture I like showing because if we don't incorporate people and livestock in the solution, we are not going to succeed with having wild places. So we have to talk about cattle ranching or rangeland use. We have to talk about how do we incorporate better agricultural practices to allow for corridors for wildlife to move between cultivated lands that produce better food, more uh, carbon friendly. Huge challenges, and I think we often misplace the investment. Certainly in Africa, a lot of conservation investment has been hugely misplaced to almost exacerbate this model rather than reversing it. And this is what we have to see more and more, and people have to learn how to do that effectively. We, we, how can we have wildlife, livestock, and humans coexist in a way that there are livelihood opportunities that truly benefit the people that have to live with these coexistence models? So there are, there's hope. African parks are mentioned as one, and we'll hear about uh, Gorongosa and Pinda just now. I would like to use North Luangwa National Park as a case study. It's in Zambia. It's in the Luangwa Valley. It's the only southern African major uh, tributary of the Zambezi that is not dammed. It flows all the way from the highlands in the northeast of Zambia into the Zambezi River. That's North Luangwa National Park. And this park was saved from pretty much losing all its wildlife because Frankfurt Zoological Society started investing there in the 1980s. In 2003, we introduced the first five rhinos into the park. The Luangwa Valley had one of the highest densities of black rhino populations that existed. They were, every last one got shot in the 80s and the 90s. But since then, they have not lost a single rhino. There's over 60 now. And those rhino investments, which live in the core of the park, have 
resulted in a net landscape investment of 20,000 square kilometers. So the species has harnessed funding uh, opportunities that wouldn't have existed if that rhino was not there. Over 400 jobs have been created directly linked to the rhinos, and a whole lot of development projects have, have been put in place. So all of these areas around... I think the battery is almost dead. Even, even we'll yeah, move to so, the other one. So the park is about uh, 5,000 square kilometers. The rhino sanctuary is 1,600 square kilometers. And then all of this land around here is what, what is termed game management area. It's community owned land that allows for wildlife uh, and natural resource management. And the investment in these landscapes by the park, both from a community development point of view and having illegal wildlife trade disruptive activities happening in that landscape has resulted no rhino to be poached in a hostile landscape. We go back to the Umphalosi example. They saved the 50 white rhinos. They grew to a couple of thousand in the Umphalosi park. Umphalosi Shishli Game Reserve now is under severe threat. They've lost over 100 rhinos this year alone. And yes, it's not quite at an extinction level, but at that trend, they will eventually become threatened in that park that originally saved them. And most of the reason for that drive of poaching is that socioeconomic investment around the park never really made the association between having that park there and the livelihood opportunities that the people have around there. And I think um, um, <clears throat> Simon will talk a little bit more about a similar model in the same landscape where there's been very little rhino poaching because of a different investment model. So there's hope, there's real hope. And I think the, the, the team that, that um, drives us are doing incredible work. Just a small team being innovative, harnessing every bit of money that they possibly can, and now hopefully going to branch out into the carbon markets to make it more sustainable. But they spend probably 50% of their time trying to find money to do the very thing that the whole world wants them to do, because that's how grant, the grant cycle works. And we need to change that model, because otherwise that landscape will come under threat again. If you remove Frankfurt from that model, within two or three years you'll have rhino poaching, you'll have elephant poaching, and massive bushmeat poaching. So, we need to find these partnership models that really are going to be sustainable going into the future. Oops, wrong side. Okay, so now I will end off, and I think we're going to show that little video of the Rhinos to Akagera. Yeah, well, once you finish, we will use that uh, to, to transition to, to, to Simon. Yeah, so I think it's a very apt example. Last year in late November, 30 white runners were moved from South Africa to Akagera National Park in Rwanda. Uh, most of you are familiar with the history of Rwanda. It was one of the uh, uh, scenes of the most atrocious human rights abuses ever committed on this planet, or at least in Africa recently, uh, to a country now that is robust. Uh, they're reinvesting in their natural re uh, heritage, uh, resulting in the ability to restock their largest national park with rhinos from Pinda, who themselves started very small and are now playing a major role at uh, contributing to a continental natural resource recovery state. And I don't know if you want to play that little video quickly and then I can hand over to okay. Simon. D don't you have like recommendations at the end or something? Yeah, I've got some recommendations. Do you want me to go through them quickly? Yeah, I think we, we, we do the recommendations and we finish and, and then we, we move to, to Simon. Okay. So just to summarize why I think so many of these translocation projects have been really successful in South Africa and I think I spoke enough about where the future has to go with regards to making sure that coexistence, partnerships, and better funding models are required. A little bit more thought about ecosystem services being the outcome of a translocation rather than just some donor-driven or ecotourism requirement. But for the, the, the successes that have been achieved, there are a couple of basic things that generally are consistent across all the projects. And the most important one, is a consistent and determined driver and leader that's present from the majority of the project and leads from the front and not from the top or from behind. Unfortunately, it is pioneering work often. So if you're not there with, the, with your team in the trenches, getting your hands dirty, you don't harness the respect. The person needs to have compassion and understand welfare con uh, requirements. That's really, really critical. If you, st if you take those two things away, there are many, many examples of disastrous translocations that took place in South Africa, commercially driven, politically driven, with animals dying en route, dying after they've been translocated, and often never really revealed because it's too politically sensitive. So that's really critical. Multidisciplinary team, and I really enjoyed the comment about 
a group of well-led amateurs often achieve much better results than the team of experts trying to do the same. I think that's, that's a, I think speaks very much to the, the African example as well. You do need political and stakeholder support, particularly now moving into areas where wildlife have been absent for a long time and the only use for wildlife has been illegal push meat or trade in its products. Uh, the, the understanding that benefits need to flow to the people that live in and around those projects is key. And it needs to be equitable and it is a very difficult thing to achieve. Not only are governments corrupt, often the chiefs themselves are corrupt. So getting that right is, often requires a skill set that's very different to doing the conservation planning. You need to have available funds that are enough, but just enough. If you have too much money, often you get you get uh, unintended consequences that you don't really want to deal with. You do need some form of expertise, uh, that's key, and there's a lot out of it in, in Africa. And certainly, you know, we, we would love to share and learn from all of you. I think this is the purpose of this workshop, which is great. And taking risks and learning from mistakes is key. And then follow-up monitoring, which often does not happen adequately enough, but if you do, I think there's been fantastic examples of where in Australia or in the, on the islands, proper follow-up monitoring has shown where things go wrong or can be improved. And then the learning and sharing component. I think that's been very well developed in, in South Africa. Yes, there is competition between practitioners and that, but more often than not, if you have a problem and you phone the guy who's done something on a different level, they're more than willing to share their knowledge. And I think that has also been partly, especially in the last few years, the acceleration of new drug uh, combinations better science behind what, what needs to be done. I mean, now I need to trans all, transfer all of that into the holistic approach, which sometimes hasn't quite taken place in that manner. Thank you. Thank you. So let me, let me introduce Simon Naylor, okay? Uh, Simon Naylor is a, is a land manager, okay? So he, he's a park manager. He, he manages a private reserve. But within his tasks and responsibility, I mean, at the same time, he's a translocation practitioner. I mean, I've I been with him, and he was directing the capture of, uh, of buffaloes, of, of African buffalo, uh, that they were being translocated to another area. I think they captured and they moved 24 buffaloes in one day. At that time, for us, working in Argentina was like, how can, I mean, we could capture one pampas deer in one day, and we were very happy to do that and very proud. So just seeing these guys capturing 24 animals, big buffaloes in one day, and he was in charge of that. So he's a land manager, so he has to manage a piece of land. He coordinates that location, but at the same time, he has to keep relations with the local mayors and with the local communities, and he has to make sure that they, they feel a, included and that they have a, a stake and an opinion on what's going on in that private reserve. And at the same time, he has to make numbers that the, the, the economy of the reserve uh, works because it's a private reserve. So you have a guy here who knows how to capture buffaloes and elephants. Actually, I was with you in an elephant just uh, capture, uh, who has to manage an ecosystem and understand fire, for example. You, you have to know when you do a cold fire or a hot fire. Um, keep, no, have a social map of what goes going ar around and have the people kind of respected and happy about it, but at the same time, the budget has to, it's like managing oceanographic at the end. I mean, this is a business. And you have people that you have to hire and you have to pay payrolls to, to maintain and all that. So that's, that's, that's the guy who's going to be talking. Um, Marcus was saying the word pinda many times, okay? and he speaks fast, okay? So, uh, Pinda is this private reserve. Uh, we're gonna see now a video that kind of tells you two things. How a private reserves, a reserve serves as, serves as a source and as a partner to bring animals to another country, Rwanda in this case, as you were saying, but also what was the, the origin of this private reserve, but uh, Simon will tell you how, how this started. So let's see this video.
want to get the rhinos from door to door in the shortest time possible. They're going to be traveling for at least 36 to 40 hours. is a little apprehensive. This is when the animals are going to be uh, at their most nervous with the, the, the sounds of the aircraft and the, and the, move, the movement of the crates. Simple number, I think three tons of paint on all of these crates. It's total trust, efficiency and proficiency is, is sort of totally above board. Moving so many rhinos at one time, this distance, it's a first. It really is conservation at scale. Finally, we're at Akagera National Park and we've managed to bring 30 rhinos here. This is the story of what is possible when we put things back the way nature intended. When we give nature a chance, the ultimate conservation goal can be achieved. The rewilding of new areas with species in dire need of sanctuary. But while 30 rhinos may have just arrived in Rwanda, this journey actually began 30 years ago when Pinda Private Game Reserve first came into being. Pinda as a, as a conservation story has been quite remarkable. It started off um, just as a small 7,500 hectare property while we were negotiating properties to the south and we eventually put together 17,000 hectares in the first few years. But the rewilding and the conservation successes of Pinda were the first reintroduction of cheetahs onto private land in KwaZulu-Natal, first adult elephants on private land in KwaZulu-Natal, the first time lion and cheetah had been reintroduced to the same property. The cheetah population has done so well that we've been able to repopulate many other reserves all over Africa. The lion population has done the same and we've been able to resupply other parks, including Akagera. So the lions from Pinda, the first international translocation of those lions was to Akagera as well. So the start of the relationship with African parks, which has been remarkable. And when we look at the elephant population and how that's grown and how much we've learned on elephant management at the Pinda operation, how to translocate elephants, picking elephants up by their feet, all these kind of um, activities had never happened before this operation took place. So the, the conservation contribution is way beyond the 30,000 hectares that now encompass Pinda 30 years later. You know, we started 30 years ago with about 30 rhinos, and over the years we managed to grow that population to a, a population of global significance. Uh, we've managed to secure them, and so we have, we believe, enough rhinos to move 30 out of that population to have no uh, impact on the remaining animals. Um, it's a wonderful story for uh, uh, Pinda, the, the return. Um, I had the privilege of being involved in introducing the animals to Pinda in its inception. So these animals are animals that I introduced here 30 years ago. And it's a really, really awesome feeling to know that these rhino are going to be the basis of what uh, is going to become a prosperous and, 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 and really wonderful population of rhino in Rwanda. Okay, so 
Simon, I think this is your presentation, okay. Be bold, be brave, be quick, wow. Uh, so tell us about, about Pinda, I mean, what's, what's the origin, what's the, the, your work there, and the significance, and, and what you can, I mean, share with the people that, that could be of use to them. Yeah, thank you. Um, good morning. Uh, hopefully you can follow this, the Spanish-speaking people. You must just tell me to slow down if you don't. Please, please. I uh, speak <laughs> like Marcus. But, um, yeah, my, so my story at Pinda started actually almost 30 years ago. I started there as a guide. Uh, I've been working as the conservation manager for 16 years. Uh, Les, who you saw in that video, was my predecessor. Um, I cannot claim all the, the glory for, for Pinda. But um, I've obviously been involved as conservation manager for a while and enough to um, sort of understand the, and have a lot of, gained a lot of experience using translocation. I'm not a scientist, um, I'm not a vet, uh, I'm not a businessman, but as, as Ignacio has said, I've had to learn all the skills to make this project work. So I, I wanted to chat about the Pinda case study and, and Ignacio and Marcus asked me to just talk about specifically Pinda and what it is, where did it, where did it, um, where did it come from? Because I think it's very, very important to bring some context and, and history. Um, and then I wanted to focus on three, three stories. Uh, I'll even call them uh, species because um, they've actually got uh, amazing stories, each one of those, uh, those animals. And obviously there's a lot more to, to Pinda than just these three, but I wanted to focus on the, the pangolin, uh, which is something that has recently, we've had to start using translocations and reintroductions to, to recover species. Obviously rhinos, white rhinos, and the cheetah, which is very, very special to, to Pinda. And an incredible success, it has been an incredible success story. So just to, just to sort of point out, um, I don't know where the pointer is here. It's on, on top. Uh, on top. Okay, so, so this is where we are. For those that don't know where Pinda is, we are in South Africa. Uh, we up uh, on the Mozambique border, close to Swaziland. Uh, in a province called KwaZulu-Natal. Um, just to give you some history of, of South Africa, and you would have seen from Marcus's slides the connectivity. Even in the 60s, there wasn't anything left. Um, South Africa was, was, was completely decimated by mostly big game hunters um, in, the, in the 1800s. These are Europeans from America and Europe. They came to South Africa to shoot uh, everything, for skins, for meat, for bones, for skulls, for tusks. Most of the tusks that were shot, elephants, they all went to America for, for billiard balls and, um, uh, and piano keys. And South Africa was pretty much decimated. Uh, so by the 1900s, um, there was no, almost no wildlife left. All that was left was small antelope and maybe a few leopards and hyenas. Can you try this? Yeah. Let's, let's see if it, if it. Things that could survive, um, um, you know, that or were not of value to, to hunters. And um, this, sort of, this sort of brings a, sort of a little bit more attention to, to Pinda. And Pinda was included in that decimation. There was... There was no wildlife left. Um, Marcus actually correctly points out um, there was literally no elephants left in South Africa. Even the Kruger National Park, which is famous for elephants, there was none there. The only elephants that survived was in Addo, and there was a very small population near Pinda called T in Tembi, which used to hide in the sand forest. But um, lions were, 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 were decimated, uh, leopards, you know, all the species pretty much. After the, after the European hunters came the, the settlers. These are the pioneers, you know, also of European descent. The British, um, the Germans, the Dutch, they came to fight in the wars and they also came for adventure and uh, to farm and, and make a living. Where, where we are, um, these, these people settled in the 1920s um, and we call them pioneers because it was, it was really, t life was tough. Um, you can see this lady, uh, these are all photographs from the area of, of Pinda. You can see this lady riding a donkey. 
because horses were killed by horse sickness and Nagana. You know, the, you know, livestock couldn't even survive. There was malaria, there was uh, black water fever, um, and so people were really, really tough. What, what wildlife did survive, these lions came from Mozambique in the, in the 60s and 70s, and they were immediately destroyed, you know, because there was cattle farming. Most of it was plowed for agriculture, for cotton and, and pineapples, um, and, and that was the landscape of, of Pinda. There was really nothing there. Um, so Pinda's a unique um, story. Uh, in the late... Um, in the late eight, eight, 1980s, um, the only wildlife areas in South Africa was on state land, you know, in the parks, national parks that Marcus spoke about. Uh, on the private land, it was agriculture, cattle farming. Um, a number of people had a vision for conservation, for wildlife conservation and, and tourism. And Pinda was, I can say, one of the the sort of leaders in this. Um, in fact, there were two individuals. In fact, none of them were conservationists. Well, they would, now they call themselves con conservationists, but the word never existed back then. Uh, one was an estate agent that was selling farms and land, and the other one was a, um, a timeshare. He, he sold timeshare. I don't know if you know what that is, uh, if you have timeshare, you know, in, in Spain, but people buy... Uh, a time in a resort and you can go and stay for a few weeks. And they saw this land in KwaZulu-Natal, which, um, which was very, very, uh, you know, the farmers were, um, there was drought, there was, um, you know, there was the elections, the, the new South African black government was, was coming. Um, and they were scared to carry on, they wanted to sell. So these two individuals bought up the land. And they created this project called, called Pinda. And as I said, it was visionary at the time. Uh, no one con conceptualized this, this sort of model of, of conservation, protecting wildlife, but using tourism uh, as the driver, but at the same time benefiting local communities. They wanted the people that lived around Pinda, the Zulu people, to benefit from the resources. So it was initially called a resource reserve, and that was the intention was to harvest grass, harvest trees, um, et cetera, et cetera. So they created, with very skilled marketing, uh, a product, a tourism product that centered around wildlife, uh, wildlife viewing. But remember, there was no wildlife. There was nothing there. It had to all be recreated. And so that's what happened in, in 1990, 1991. Um, as Marcus sort of pointed out, um, it was a huge gamble, uh, and that's why I put there, be bold, be brave, because at the time there was also no tourism, there was no international tourism. No one wanted to come to South Africa because of apartheid, um, there was unrest, there was violence, there was civil war. So these guys started this project uh, with, no, with no tourism, um, but they believed in the, in, the, in the vision and the model. So 7,000 hectares was purchased. And this is the model here. It's very simple. Um, it's care of the land, care of the wildlife and the people, and the driver is, is tourism, is these people that are sitting in the back here. And they're guided by experienced guides, and they come to see wildlife. Um, but as a consequence, uh, local communities, people that live around uh, the parks, and you must remember there's a lot of people living around here, rural, impoverished, unemployed people, they would see the benefits and they would buy into the, the belief that wildlife is good for them, is positive. And that's exactly what happened. And so this model was created. It was completely new in South Africa. Um, and a lot of other places now followed that. So Medikwe, um, I mean, now it's a common, this, this model is common everywhere. But it really, really started here at Pinda. And what was unique at Pinda was that it had to be created completely from scratch. So every, every single animal was brought back. Um, cheetahs, uh, elef uh, elephants, as in the video, these were the first elephants ever translocated out of the Kruger National Park, were brought to, to Pinda. I don't know if you can saw, see from this photograph, there's a trunk sticking out of the truck as the people go by. 
um, giraffes, uh, wildebeest, you name it, everything had to be brought. Leper uh, uh, cheetahs, lions, um, and I'll talk about uh, cheetahs just now, but, but many of this was first in South Africa. Um, the skills of translocation hadn't been developed yet. And as Marcus pointed out, as, as, we, as we started to do it, we started to learn. I mean, these are young elephants. These are 10-year-old elephants. These are all orphans from, from uh, Shootings and Kalin in, in the Kruger National Park. Simon, yeah. I think we have to go for five, 10 minutes. Sorry? Aim to five or, or 10 minutes. More, okay? left. Yeah. Oh, OK. Let me speed so, up. So, so we sorry. can fit everything, yeah. Yeah, sorry I, I for the speak Spanish speakers then. So this is what Pinda looks like today. There's been an incredible expansion. Uh, we are now almost 30,000 hectares. And many of this is private land, community-owned land. Um, there's a little bit of state land, so it's a real mixture. It's not even, but what is unique is that it's now a protected area. It's like a national park. So I wanted to focus quickly on, on three species. Uh, cheetah, uh, these are the first cheetah that were successfully reintroduced and are breeding, created a breeding project uh, at Pinda. There were many, many attempts before but it only worked at Pinda, and it comes for, for, for a number of reasons. Um, the techniques that were used in the translocation is, is one of the big reasons. They used a soft-release process. Uh, many of you will, will, will know this individual, Dr. Luke Hunter. He did his PhD at Pinda, and there's a number of individuals here that are still involved in conservation today that, that created these groundbreaking techniques of reintroducing these large, uh, large carnivores. Um, Well-maintained fences, uh, very intense post-release monitoring, which is what Dr. Luke Hunter did. Um, we introduced uh, cheetah before the lions. Um, there were very low densities of leopard and hyena. Um, and we had the communities involved right from the beginning. Um, and obviously veterinary intervention, I believe, is, is very, very important. Um, I think we all know the saying that, that some animals are more equal than others in our case. It is the cheetah, and if it wasn't for these interventions, these cheetah would not have survived. They really are under pressure from uh, other predators, um, uh, bush encroachment and things like that. But any opportunity, even if it's a natural injury, we intervene. It's one of the few species that we break our sort of non-intervention um, policy. You can see all the surgeries and uh, uh, interventions here. Something that, that came out of um, the success of these projects is a metapopulation management approach. And I think it's important to raise it because in South Africa and, and actually now in the rest of Africa now, it's becoming more popular is this metapopulation management where there's this coordinated approach of managing one species but in multiple sites. And it's been done very successfully. It's been coordinated often not by one individual, but by a group of individuals or NGOs, or it just happens by itself. Um, to give you an example, the cheetah, and this has been the success of the cheetah, and it's been really driven hard by uh, an NGO called EWT. They must take a lot of credit with all these small populations. There's Pinda there. It was the first green dot. Now you can see all the successful uh, cheetah populations, and that's all managed as one. And we have a, and that's over 400 now. This is old, old figures, but so much so that these animals are now um, getting translocated to um, to other countries now. We've got cheetah going to India shortly, uh, Mozambique, Malawi, Zambia, um, where else? Yeah, all over. So it's been an incredible success story. Uh, just to give you an idea, we started with 12 cheetah. We've had 310 births, um, and we've relocated about almost a, a 100 cheetah now out of Pinda. Pangolins, um, this is very close to my heart. Um, it's a species that I'd never seen before. It's, uh, very, uh, it's become incredibly uh, traded. I think everyone knows the pangolin. This is the Terminix ground pangolin. These are all animals that are now on Pinda. This, this, this pangolin here is a male that was found in a cupboard, um, and it's become one of the most studied pangolins now on Earth uh, at Pinda. Um, and all of these ha are, are recovered from the illegal wildlife trade. We used to have uh, ground pangolins at Pinda. They went locally extinct many years ago, 
and by chance, um, going back to be, being brave and bold and making decisions quickly, we were offered two pangolins to reintroduce and we took the decision not knowing anything about how to manage them, how to hold them, how to monitor them, um, what they eat, what they do, we, we knew nothing. Uh, but we took these two pangolins and we've made it an, an incredible success. One of the successes is a, is a release uh, protocol which also was not developed. So this is, goes back to learning by doing uh, and collaborating with others. We monitor them very intensively. We weigh them almost every day for the first few weeks and months. It's very, very intensive work. Um, some are hand-raised, which we've managed to uh, introduce. This one here in particular is the first hand-raised pangolin ever to be rewilded. Um, you can see how much effort we had to put in um, taking it out every day to feed and then taking it home, uh, eventually we could rewild it after about eight months. Um, again, um, very little sort of medically known about pangolins. Uh, this is a, a really experienced vet that we work with. He'd never seen a pangolin, never touched one, and he had to do an operation, uh, an anesthesia, uh, remotely on a Zoom call with, with another vet who had more experience um, and, for example, we didn't even know where to take blood from a pangolin. So all these things uh, we had to learn, um, taking x-rays, we had to put pangolins in um, nebulizers, we had to improvise, use boxes. Um, so it, it's been an incredible experience, but uh, I can sort of proudly say that uh, we've had uh, four births now. Um, these, and remember, these are all re re rescued pangolins. They're very stressed animals. Um, they don't know this habitat as well. Um, and this is the first birth uh, that we had two years ago. And I can also, one of our objectives was to, to have pangolins disperse out of Pinda. And uh, there's a, um, a tag reading now a few days ago of this, this young male pangolin that has dispersed into a neighboring game reserve which has achieved one of the objectives that we have was breeding and then dispersal. So it just shows you what can be done in a very short space of time from knowing nothing. Um, just to mention our partners, Oak Foundation and the African Pangolin Working Group. And then I'll just talk quickly about white rhinos. Um, again, groundbreaking work. Uh, Pinde uh, introduced 23 white rhinos in one day. It was at that time the most ever moved. Um, by our, our predecessors. We under severe pressure in, in Africa and certainly in South Africa with regards to white rhino. This photograph I took about five years ago. This was one of the rhinos that we lost, um, which has forced us to become um, almost milit uh, semi-military or, or armies. We've created our own armies now to protect not just pangolins but rhinos. Well, we started with rhinos, but we've really become uh, Milit we've, we've militarized um, uh, conservation. So one of my other jobs is a general. Um, I don't know anything about security, but we've had to learn very, very fast. Um, but because of, uh, well, I mean, you saw in the video, we started with 30 rhinos. We've probably exported or, or sold about 250 rhinos out of Pinda. It's, they've done really, really well, so much so that when we were approached to join and partner with Great Plains to move rhinos to Botswana, we decided to move 100, and I can say about 30 of those rhinos came, maybe 40 of those rhinos came from Pinda alone. Um, again, Marcus spoke about some of the groundbreaking work. This, at the time, was also the largest translocation of rhino uh, in, in history. Um, many first, um, you know, Moving rhinos in a big plane, we moved 12. That was a big, big deal for us. Uh, we, 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 we moved six rhinos in a truck over 48 hours. They were the first rhinos that we moved. That was the longest journey uh, by road. Um, some of the tech, sorry, some of the, the, the technologies that we're using were also starting to be uh, groundbreaking, um, you know, because I think the post release is very, very important. And then lastly, um, as the video and Marcus has spoken about, we were involved in the translocation of rhinos together with African Parks um, to Rwanda. 30 rhinos last year, the largest translocation. Uh, a huge undertaking, lots of uh, planning, logistics, 
um, involved in that. And there's the team at Pinda when we moved the rhinos on the day. But just to also highlight that with these big operations, um, you know, you don't hear it in the news, but sometimes they don't go well, you know. Um, this rhinos uh, was, was, was very stressed. We spoke to some of the vets yesterday about this, the, uh, the tsetse flies and the, the risk of uh, trypanosomas. Um, we haven't really moved rhinos into, from areas that don't have trips um, to these areas now that have lots of tsetse flies. So we had to sort of uh, give, give um, um, samarin, which is the, um, uh, the uh, prov uh, you prophylactic for, for uh, um, sleeping sickness. And the rhinos didn't do well with it. So these are things that we're learning. Um, this rhino survived. All 30 survived the journey and, and made it, but it was very, very stressful. Um, but just a few pictures of the translocation, uh, an amazing operation. Um, and then just in closing, I, I think some of the lessons I've learned over the years, uh, not, generally, not so much uh, specific about uh, translocations, but um, just generally, I do believe the future of... of Wildlife in Africa is, is to empower and educate women in local communities. Um, I think we need to do that, do that more, and specifically because women hold the key to um, developing their own, their own communities around protected areas. We, we need to learn more by doing. Uh, we do it a lot, but we need to do more, more of it, and we need to share that knowledge and experience. We don't share these experiences enough, and that's why these conferences are really, really good. Um, if we fail to plan, we plan to fail. Planning is, 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 is really, really key in all these, all these operations and everything to do with wildlife. Uh, conservation costs a lot of money. We really, really need to secure alternative sources of revenue. Um, NGOs and philanthropic models are not enough to secure our wildlife. There's a lot of wildlife in Africa that needs, um, and tourism alone is not going to do it. Hunting is on decline. We need to find other sources like carbon and other um, sort of nature tokens or, or biodiversity tokens that can support and, and uh, create value to land. We need to manage social media carefully. I know, I, don't, I think no one has mentioned it. Social media has a, a very huge role to play in, in, in translocations, but it can also be a, a double-edged sword. It can really, really not work in our favor. So we have to manage social media very carefully. Uh, we have to trust and act our gut feeling. Um, a lot of the guys that are doing this work, they, they're not scientific in their thinking. They, 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 they make decisions on gut. And I think many of us lose, especially uh, scientists I see, um, they, they, start to, they don't think with their, with, their, with their gut enough, and we have to trust our gut. Um, and then stay true to your principles and ethics. Teamwork and collaboration is, is key. Uh, egos is a... Is a uh, is a big danger in our in our industry in translocations. I've seen too many uh, egos derail a translocation right at the beginning, and then be bold, be brave, and be quick. I think without that, we we will not achieve what we what we uh, set out to do. Thank you very much. Thank you. So now, Mark, why, why Mark Stallmans? Uh, I mean, Mark is the scientific director of another uh, rewilding program that uses translocations as a main tool. Uh, this happens in Mozambique. I think the reason why we are seeing this is to see all the connections, and these are not isolated cases. That is, there's a huge trend going in the continent. I think second, because it's, it's an area that is not fenced. There's, there's kind of this feeling uh, in, in Europe and North America, they, okay, they do it because they work in fenced areas. Uh, Gorongosa is not fenced, so you, you don't need fences to do that. And I think the second is the, this strong connection that you, that you see in all these stories in, in Africa between ecological restoration and local development, which it is kind of counterintuitive, at least in the European context, when the two things tend to be opposite. Either you do conservation or you do development. But how they are always connected here and one reinforces each other. Uh, the, the main donor in this, in this process is an American who 
got interested into Mozambique because of civil rights, because of, of human development, and ended up investing in parks and, and, and that because he saw that as a tool to promote human development. So how both, I mean, you can start in one, from one side and go to another and, and, and the other way. And I think this is very important. So please, Mark, welcome. Thank you, Ignacio, and uh, good morning. I'm glad to be here. So, rewilding of Gorongosa National Park. Why would we have to rewild uh, Gorongosa National Park? Firstly, where's uh, Gorongosa? That's a um, map of Africa, southern Africa here. Mozambique is this long country, long border on the um, Indian Ocean. And we're basically in central Mozambique, uh, between the Zambezi River, which everybody knows, and another big river, the Pungwe River. This is a park of around um, just shy of 400,000 hectares of 4,000 square kilometers with a buffer zone of um, 600,000 hectares, around 200,000 people in that buffer zone. Now, in, that's the oldest national park of Mozambique, proclaimed in 1960, and it was really known for having one of the highest wildlife densities in Africa. So it's not one of the biggest parks in Africa, but it just because of its being in the Rift Valley, very fertile soils, good rainfall, um, a lot of flooding uh, during the, the wet months, and it just makes for this hugely productive environment that can carry a lot of animals. So it was really well known. It was kind of a fairly um, uh, a sexy destination. A lot of people from Hollywood visited through in the, the early 60s, like the astronauts from the first uh, moon landing. They went on a world tour. They visited Gorongosa. It was that kind, kind of scene in, in colonial days. And as you can see from this black and white photograph, huge densities of wildlife. Now then came the, um, the liberation war uh, from Portuguese uh, col colonialist rule. In 1974, Mozambique gained independence and very quickly um, descended into to total civil war that lasted on and off and for, for 20 years and with, with periods of insecurity afterwards. Uh, we had this extreme decimation of, of wildlife. And I was talking to some, some of you yesterday, for example, 14,000 buffalo went down to less than 100 buffalo. 6,000 wildebeest went down to less than 15 wildebeest. So an extreme decimation for some of the reasons that Marcus was, was explaining. It's ivory for, to, to buy weapons, meat to, to feed the armies, or just to feed yourself. Um, and that continued even after the peace was reached, because people were just desperate. Uh, Mozambique is still one of the poor, very poor countries uh, on the world uh, ranking list. Now, in 2004, 2005, uh, an American philanthropist, as um, uh, Ignacio mentioned, visited uh, Mozambique. He was interested in doing something uh, with nature for the people around uh, those parks. He chose uh, Gorongosa, established a long-term agreement with the government, and it really started a, a new dawn uh, for that park. So the key aspects, and I won't go through, I want to actually have a little bit of time left on to discuss the one slide with, with the recommendations and, and also some of the things that are from yesterday I picked up and, and some of the recurring themes to, from this morning's presentation. I think there's a lot of, of convergence and I'd like to talk a little bit more about that than, than giving you all the details about Gorongosa. So I'll, I won't go through all of those points. If you want to talk to me afterwards, uh, we can do that. But one of the, the really important things that we heard that yesterday, again, with the Oceanic Islands, is that the time it takes to recover species, up to three decades. Um, we're working on a long term uh, time horizon. Originally, it was 20 years, starting with the, the agreement was only signed in 2008. But in 2018, we had a midterm review, and the government renewed the, the agreement for 25 years. So we, we start, restarted the clock in 2008 for 25 years. And it's that kind of time horizon that allows you to, to look at, at more a strategic approach, um, a systematic approach, and some of the, the species that we want to bring in, and at the whole human development, you can really work on, on, on generations of, of, of people uh, rather than having those short-term interventions that last typically three years in, in a funding cycle, or perhaps five years, if you're lucky. And it being driven by, originally, and still being driven uh, by, by Greg, um, he comes from a human rights background, as we heard from, from Ignacio. So it's really 
advancing human development and conservation at the same time and mutually reinforcing uh, each other rather than seeing it as, as a kind of a competing, um, competing approach where the one has to be subservient to the other. And I think you, you can, and what we just heard from, from Simon about how, how important those rewilding projects can be from, from an economic perspective, from a, from a development perspective. I don't see that as a contradiction and, and I believe that's something that could probably be, be, be brought into, for example, a European perspective where rewilding of a landscape is not kind of going, going backwards in time. It is going backwards in time in terms of what we want to re-establish, but it's not going backwards in time as, as people see, see going backwards in terms of progress whether we agree with those values or not, but it's, it's actually another form of economy which, which you can put into place. And I think it's a, also a form of economy with, with new jobs uh, that didn't exist previously, jobs that, that allow for, 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 for mobility in terms of, of intellectual development. I think one that, that can also address uh, gender issues, um, especially if we see, for example, and I see that from the, from the visiting scientists coming from the Europe and the US, where, where on the biological side, we, we, for example, see a lot more female uh, researchers than male researchers. And in Africa, we still uh, got, got a much older pattern of, of a male-dominated uh, conservation uh, scene. And I think all of those dynamics or can play themselves out in, in the rewilding over large areas. And I think it's, it's not um, limited to, to Africa. I think some of the, those things can find their way back into Europe. So we, we are locally registered NGO. We employ uh, close to 1,000 people, not only in the park, but probably half of them are working, or more than half of them are working outside the, the park on conservation, agriculture, um, education, uh, supporting the, the provincial service, uh, health services with mobile clinics and, and things like that. So the park has really become an engine of economic growth. But the park itself obviously has to look at, at some of its, its, its kind of foundational values and wildlife was, was really the basis of the park and, and it's, it remains a hugely important driver uh, representing biodiversity, the kind of the, the ecosystem services delivered by those large animals. Um, as you saw, we, we had this, those tremendous losses and they, they continued as we started the project. We, we, we still had, had huge issues with snares and, and gin traps, and those very simple arms that, uh, that Marcus was talking about, but with the pot potential to really empty a landscape. So we had a big reorganization of our law enforcement force. Um, much better training, equipment, motivation. And uh, that has really resulted in, in a tremendous recovery of those species that still had viable uh, pockets uh, left, sufficient numbers left. Obviously, some species, like uh, the, the one I mentioned, the buffalo and the, the wildebeest, were so far down that we would have had to wait basically forever to, to, to get good numbers coming back. So we supplemented that with translocation. Now, if you look at that table, the total number of, of animals that we put back into Gorongosa National Park is just over 500 animals. That's nothing. We've heard those figures from, from South Africa, from Zimbabwe, Namibia. Um, there's a lot of individual farmers that will do more than 500 animals in a year, for perhaps for commercial ranching purposes, but 500 animals is very, is very few. Uh, but what's been absolutely critical for us is the 210 buffalo that we put in and 180 wildebeest. So that, that, together with 100, or less than 100 that uh, were left, have now increased our buffalo um, population to, my, my, the, the last count we did in 2020 was 1,100, and we got around 800 uh, wildebeest now um, at the last count. So I'm expecting those numbers to, to, go, to be further up when we count again in, uh, at the end of October this year. There's been a sprinkling of other species for, for different reasons. Um, it was more kind of like availability and incidental. And then the, the, the more recent introductions have been focusing on, on carnivores, where we've uh, re-established wild dogs. We, we brought in 40, 40 wild dogs, including animals from close to, to Pinda. So it's always the same names cropping up again. So it's, there's really a lot of connectivity between those different projects. 
and um, we started Leopard also in 2000. Um, and um, you can see those are very small numbers, but carnivores generally already established in much smaller numbers, but those 40, 40 odd uh, wild dogs have already grown to more than 130, and we've already started uh, taking some animals out uh, in terms of a meta population strategy to, to, other, to other areas. So we used the sanctuary as a, for the, to support the initial introduction, so rather than releasing animals in, in a huge landscape and kind of losing them uh, when they're at small densities. We, we bulk them up in a sanctuary where we had much, much better control, so much smaller area. Um, we only used translocations where we didn't have those viable uh, populations. We had to work on the reduction of threats. We've, that's a constant theme that we've been hearing right through. Uh, Mark, you can, Mark yeah. is, explain the concept of sanctuary because the, the, it's, it's quite new. The people don't know it very much. What's the sanctuary inside the park? Okay. What, what does so, it mean? Yeah. So sanctuary, we, uh, there's different terms used, for example, with rhino protection. People will often be talking in, uh, about the IPZ, uh, intensive protection zone. So it's just a smaller area that, that will be almost per definition fenced, where you can have very good control over your initial introductions, whether you could even take, if you had very small numbers of animals, what we heard from, from the islands yesterday, take a few of the, the survivors, put them into a more intensive, almost breeding facility at the scale of African ungulates and, and, and carnivores that would still be at the, the order of a few thousand hectares. But you can really focus your efforts, you can keep that secure, uh, from, from those external threats whilst you are working on those external threats in the larger landscape. Like our, uh, our rangers weren't sufficiently trained, we didn't have sufficient rangers for the larger landscape, but we could do that for the sanctuary. So you bring in a few animals, which then, because there are good conditions there, uh, we, we kept it predator free uh, for, those, uh, for those nine years that we used the sanctuary, they can really increase at very fast rates and you start moving animals out of that sanctuary as soon as you reach capacity or before you reach capacity because you really want to keep the breeding at a, at a, high, at a high rate. Or alternatively, if you reach capacity, then you open the sanctuary uh, to the larger park, which is what we did even before we, we really reached capacity. We felt we, we had sufficient number of buffalo and wildebeest. We just opened up portion of the fence for the animals to disperse naturally. So that's really the, the use of a sanctuary. It's been a, quite a popular tool in, in, um, in Mozambique. So on the map that, uh, that Marcus showed us for, for the Greater Limpopo Transfrontier Park, all those animals or most of the animals that came from the Kruger Park were moved in a first phase to a sanctuary that actually bordered on the Kruger Park. Uh, that was a very big sanctuary, it was around 30,000 hectares. They didn't even bother with a very solid fence on the Mozambican side uh, because they knew they were only going to use it as a, as a stopgap measure. So it was, I think, around three years after which the fence was removed and the animals moved into a larger landscape. The same approach is being used in, in Zinav National Park, uh, where the first sanctuary was around 7,000 7, hectares. Had been uh, increased to around 18,000 hectares is being increased again, and it just be able to accommodate larger numbers of, of animals, and as those sanctuary animals breed up, they need more space, but the, the, the greater landscape wasn't ready yet for, for fuller release. Um, so it's, it's been a very popular uh, system in, in Mozambique, and it's one of the ways that you can kind of overcome um, your, your, your own uh, limitations, and I think it's also a way that you could probably overcome a lot of resistance from your from your, your communities, your, your, your politicians, as, as by having a, a good example. It's, it's also a very good training ground for your staff. It's a very good educational um, tool because it's a place where you can for sure uh, show those animals to, to visiting people. Um, I think one has to be, be pragmatic about it. We, we had a, a lot of resistance internally at, uh, in the beginning to any tourism, for example, to the sanctuary kind of like, oh, you can't do that, those animals, you, you, don't, you shouldn't be disturbing them or you, you're going to expose them to some danger. And I think you, you need to be much more pragmatic and take people on board, um, get, get people interested because you need to build that constituency that's going to support your, your, your efforts. So I think as scientists, um, we, we tend to be, be very protective of um, when we do translocations. I, I tend to, 
we feel that we, we need to be, be much more open and, because people are really interested in what you do. There's a risk, obviously, that you expose your failures, but that's, you can explain your failures if, you, if you've approached it well. Um, I think we really need to, to bring in people because that's going to build support. That's my personal opinion. Okay. Um, that's, I think that's basically what I wanted to, to show and, and, and share with you. But I think the more I, the more I hear from, from yesterday, the, the several points that came up that I didn't think about in terms of, of recommendations or, or lessons learned, um, I think it's the, same, it's the same kind of things coming up all over again. Um, so to me, translocations are a fantastic tool, but we need to bring the, use them in the, in the right context. So I think there can be either an overemphasis on them or an or a under, underemphasis on them. And, um, and often I think is do, do it well, perhaps in smaller numbers, than, than use bigger numbers where, where, where you might, if, if you bring animals in, in the wrong environment or you don't have the, the right supporting system or the right monitoring afterwards, I think you could waste, waste a lot of effort um, and, and money. So I think you, you need to identify your, your problems and, and come up with solutions that are really tailored to that. Um, but what's, what's also coming through is this bureaucracy and I think this hesitancy. We do have to take those risks. Uh, we don't always have time to, to, to get to the final kind of scientific detail. And I think that's, that's what Africa has, has really re learned. There's, there's a lot of pragmatism and kind of like, Let's do it, because not doing it as, uh, as an alternative is not, is not a viable alternative, because we, because we know we're going to lose those species. And the northern subspecies of the white rhino is, is really a textbook example of, we could have avoided that, uh, I think, relatively easily um, if we wanted to. But, but I think it's, it's NGO politics and so on that played too much of a role, rather than, than a pragmatic approach to countering the threat. Um, one little thing I wanted to say is, it's not only, that, 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 and I think that's, that's something that could really be, be an industry in, in Europe, is this translocation business. Uh, the, the techniques were pioneered in the, in the kind of the official sector, conservation sector in South Africa, but there's, there's, there's several reasons why, why it kind of moved out and why some capacity was lost in the official organizations. But one, one element is also because of the seasonality of the translocation. We, we can only do it uh, when, mostly do it when temperatures are down. So, and in Europe, I would, would think a lot of it you would probably not do in, in the winter, for example. So you often get your staff, your, 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 your official staff, or you, yeah, if that's their job, it's only like, it's almost like a seasonal job, but you wanted expertise. In the private sector, they, they, they basically capitalize on, on doing projects in different places and spread the seasons a little bit longer, use that same equipment for a lot more work. And, and I think there's an efficiency there in terms of, of scale and efficiency, in terms of specializing. Um, and the, the, the capital investment kind of makes sense at that level, whilst in an official organization, it becomes almost like a, a side issue, especially if you've been successful in your initial rewilding and, and translocations. You might no, no longer need it in 10 years or 20 years' time. In, this, in the private sector, it's, it's like a rolling thing going from one project to, to another. And um, I think there's a lot of expertise that's been built up uh, based on that, that original development that becomes a business. And again, we, we're talking about this economy of, of rewilding. Um, which, which I see as a, as a very positive development for the future. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank, thanks a lot. Thank you much.